Hoop Dreams, the podcast, an Unlearning Network production. Joining us today, the one and only Chicago legend, played for the famous Al McGuire, Marquette legend, the only Marquette legend that has actually played in two Final Fours. Let me correct you. See, I have to always correct everybody on that, Will. See, I played in two national championship games. That's oh, right. two that's national different. championships. <laughs> yeah, that's the difference. That's right. You know, a lot of people nowadays just get into the Final Four, they settle for that. No, I that's played, right. I was that's the right. last man standing in two of them. And that's right. One I won and one I lost. So I like to correct everybody, but sorry to interrupt you, but go ahead with your introduction, little brother. I stand corrected. <laughs> the only Marquette player to ever play in two championship games, winning the 1977 championship. As a matter of fact, not just in my opinion, but many opinions, uh, has put Marquette on the map. Not only that, the only player that I know created, played in his own uniform that he designed. As a matter of fact, man, we don't get so much into that. But the 1997 draft, 17th overall pick, join us today on the Hoop Dreams podcast, none other than Maurice, Bo, Ellis, and Will Gates, and that's my dog, Arthur A.G. Man, it's good to see you. Thank you. It's kind of funny to uh, be here and you know, to be a, to be a part of the whole movie is still right today, seeing it on Showtime and stars on, on every day and stuff. So uh, I, I'm glad for you, too. Speaking of that, Coach, you, you kicked it right off because that's how we kick our show off. When was the first time you saw the movie and yourself in it? <laughs> I, you know, it, it's, it's been so long. I, I don't remember. Actually, I do because I, I think uh, Stephen and them sent me a copy uh, when it first was, it was ready to go out. So they saw mm-hmm. me, sent me a copy. So I, I sat down and watched it. And I've watched it numerous times over the years. And and I laugh. And, and, and it's funny, you know, to think about a lot of the filming we were doing when Will was at uh, Dave Kreider's camp in Cincinnati. And then you mm-hmm. look at all of the, you know, players, the Jawan Howards, the Chris Webbers, the Jason Kids. Uh, the Tommy yep. Clyde Smith, the uh, the, the Will <laughs> Gates, and all, all, it was loaded. That camp was loaded. And one of my favorite stories that I tell in Milwaukee, because little Cal Rayford that went to Kansas, we were on him Cal too Rayford. out of Milwaukee. But Cal didn't have the grades, so uh, it didn't work out. But I saw little Cal Rayford give Jason Kidd the business in that camp. I mean, little Cal was going to work, and those two was going at it. And we'll know what I'm talking about. And little Cal, every time I see him, he's a high school coach in Milwaukee. You know, I'm back in Milwaukee all the time. And and realistically, Milwaukee is my home, too. You know, I I left Chicago when I was 18 and 19 years old to go to Marquette. Right. Then the four years I spent at Marquette as a student, then I played in the NBA. Then I came back in 88, you know, the coach, and I was yeah. there from 88 to 98 as the assistant coach, and then went back home, came back home to Chicago, and Chicago stayed for a couple, five years, and then I went back for another. So I got 17 years up in Milwaukee, so I spent a lot of time. Mm-hmm. I do a lot of things in Milwaukee, and Milwaukee is a, as much my home as Chicago, and, and, and that's how life goes, especially when you go to college. And people have been very yeah. good to me up there and great situation for me. Coach, did a lot of people uh, see you in the film? Oh, yeah. People still talk about that right today. Kids, <laughs> kids, kids, kids you got you to get up. on these kids and start writing them early before everybody else writes them. You know oh, what I'm yeah. saying? No, look, no. At these, look at these guys. They bodies, man. These kids is just teenagers. They got they got grown man's bodies right now. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you remember that, too? That that's a lot. 
that, that, I, 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 I was standing there with uh with Jesse from uh, Arizona and, and also Frank Kendrick from Purdue, who were very close to me. And, you know, we, we still laugh when I run into them, you know, over the years. I haven't seen Frank. Actually, Frank recruited me at Purdue out of Parker High School here in Chicago because one of my uh, my Frostoff coach went to Purdue and he is from Indiana and he got me to go and I visited Purdue. But, you know, once Coach McGuire came in, the rest is history. And, yes. you know, then Lloyd Walton was already at Marquette and he brought in uh, Maurice Lucas and Jimmy Jones to recruit me. And they Ooh. came to my house in Inglewood on 71st Street. They came to the apartment building. What? Once that had happened, uh, the rest was history. So to tell you the quick story about that, I didn't really sign until almost uh, it was late June because uh, Marquette didn't really have a scholarship available until Larry McNeil decided to leave school early and he didn't decide to go until almost June. So that scholarship opened up late. And then uh, Lloyd Lloyd Walton had set out the year before, who Lloyd, who played at Mount Carmel, I was very close to, had known the little guard and one of the Marquette all-time greats. And Lloyd told Coach Mm -hmm. Raymonds and Al, he said, we need to go to Chicago to see Bo Ellis. He's still out there. So uh, Coach Raymonds and uh, them, they came down to see me. And then Jimmy, they sent Jimmy Jones and Maurice Lucas and, you know, the rest is kind of history, and, and that's how the whole thing started off. And, you know, it's similar to, you know, once I, when I was recruiting Will and also Arthur, because, uh, Arthur, you didn't know this real quick. You know, Coach Bedford would be very proud of you, and I didn't really realize this until some years later after I saw that Coach Bedford had passed away. Coach Bedford and myself, we have the same birthday on August the 8th. And I realized why he and I were so close for all those years. And it wasn't just about the players that I was recruiting from Marshall of his school. It was just a relationship that we had, you know, over the years. And as I grew older and my coaching uh, stints and when I was at Chicago State. So, yeah, Arthur, uh, Coach Bedford and I, August 8th, we share the same birthday. And I didn't oh. know that Coach Bedford and Glenn Rivers' dad was very close. I actually, I think they were neighbors. And uh, yeah, sure was. And, and when and when uh, when Marquette was on uh, Glenn, and that's when Rick Majerus was there, and uh, and Hank Ramis that took over. And I had just got back from uh, playing. I had stopped playing in the NBA in 1980, so I had went overseas a couple of years because my knees was bothering me, and, and I, I kept playing. I, a lot of people don't know I played a year and a half with a partially torn cartilage, the same thing that Joel Embiid is going through. I, I had that. I, I, hurt, I hurt my knee in the summer league at Dr. King's Boys Club. I was playing defense, mm. and somebody went to go to the baseline, and I went to move to my right, and I felt something pop. But I never told anybody because the summer league had started before the NBA draft. So I went to to see my my attorney who was Herb Rudoy, and he sent me to this doctor. And back then, there was no orthoscopic surgery. They had to put – they put the dye in your knee, you know, but the dye on on, on that test wasn't but maybe 75% effective. So it showed I had a slightly torn cartilage. So – I wasn't really crazy about getting the operation because I saw older guys before me that had similar yeah. injuries, and I looked mm-hmm. at their knee, and they mm-hmm. had scars on there about eight inches long. I like, shit, no way I'm gonna Whoa. be taking that. <laughs> so, so I asked the doctor, could I get it right? So that summer before the draft, I never told anybody. I got it right. I swam. I did everything I needed to do. I went to camp. Mm-hmm. I passed all my tests and everything. But I still wasn't 100%. And then about in the middle of my second year, we were practicing. And I went, they threw a pass to me. We were doing a drill and the ball went through my hand and I stopped to plant my right leg and my knee just completely blew out. It looked like my bone had popped out. It scared me to death. So, you know, I ended up going and 
that's what uh, that was like 1978. So that was the first year that orthoscopic surgery had came out. So I went mm -hmm. to LA. Uh, I had a doctor talk to Tony Daly, who was the Olympic doctor back then. And uh, after I had that, he came back to me. He said, Bo, I don't know how you can even walk. But he said, orthoscope can't correct this. Your cartilage has completely exploded. So we're going to have to go in and tell, uh, clean it up and take it out. So I went and I went back to L.A., had it done. And to about a month and a half, two months, no, it's about a month and a half later, I was back playing. So I ended up playing my second year. <laughs> And went back, and I'm looking at some of these guys in the league now. So they get a, a high ankle sprain, and they out there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. But that's one reason you see these hands. See, I just played right. it, and that's why these hands and this arthritis. But other than that, I've been blessed. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't had any other problems with high blood pressure or diabetes and none other things like that. But, you know, I feel that pain you know, from playing on the playground. So when I'm talking to young kids all the time and I see them looking at my hands, I'm like, yeah, you, you look at players and you think that when you're a pro, everything is roses. I'm like, there's a price to pay when you become a professional athlete. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm here, I'm your witness. Look at these hands. So, you know, a lot of things happen. So, but I've been blessed. I've been blessed. No doubt about that. When the cartilage left, was it, was it bone on bone? Yeah, but, you know, it didn't bother me and stuff. You know, every now and then, oh. even, even today, uh, if I make a certain move somewhere, you can feel the kind of grind. But, you know, once they talk, take it out, because really the cartilage in between your knee is nothing but like a sponge. You know, like you saying, between, you know, the knee there. But, you know, right. it can do. But I, I never had any problems. I, I continued to play and you know, I had a lot wow. of guys from the West Side used to ask me, say, Bo, just think about the type of career you would have had in the league if you would have never blew your leg out at the boys club. And there's not very many people that even mm. know that unless you're really, really close to me. So I wanted to wow. share that story with you. And I thought you were, I think I told Will that before. Yeah, you did Will, tell me that one. Absolutely. Will, Cause Will was going through a lot and you saw always try to, you know, keep him on the level here because as a young man, mm -hmm. he was going through some traumatic things and, you know, it, it was a little different yeah. when I was coming along, but nevertheless, it, it's still not easy, especially when you have goals and dreams and, dreams. you know, you have yeah. to deal with it and, and it becomes a, a, a different situation. So I, I was just glad to be able to get three years in. So I got my three years in. I was able to get my pension because all you need is three in the NBA. And still got some of that money. Still got some of that money put away nowadays. So, right. so I, 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 I've been blessed. I've been blessed. No doubt about that, man, Bo. It's, it's it's so many questions we gotta we gotta ask you, but we we into telling your story. So we want to know the Bo Ellis story. So so give us, man. What neighborhood did you grow up in? Chicago. How was Chicago growing up for you? doing your time? I grew up on 71st and Normal, which is the south side of Chicago, and that's the real mm. Inglewood. Yeah, that's the real Inglewood. Because Parker High yeah. School, where I went to school, was on 69th and Stewart, and Inglewood High School was down on 63rd and Stewart. So Inglewood and Parker was only realistically like five blocks away. Now on mm. 63rd Street, that was the Disciples. That was David Barksdale. And on 68th Street at Parker High School, where I went to high school, that was the Gangsters, and that was Larry Hoover. So, so yeah, so I grew up Man. on 71st Street. I grew up right across the street from Hamilton Park. Hamilton okay. Park is right on the corner of 72nd and Normal. And, and Hamilton Park stretches from 72nd, 73rd, and 74th Street. And then it got normal. And then going west, you had Parnell. Then you had railroad tracks and low. And then going mm -hmm. east of that, you you had uh uh well you had Eggleston and Stewart. And in between that, the park was in between two railroad tracks. So you had an entrance right. and exit at 72nd, 73rd, and 74th. And Will and Arthur at every exit and entrance. It was a different game mm -hmm. when you crossed under that viaduct, but nothing Ooh, like damn. today. And, and 
Yeah. You know, so and all and all of us use the same part. But the thing about it is we all pretty much went to the same elementary schools and high schools. So a lot of them, okay. you know, had to come from those areas to come up to Parker High School once they uh, left there. But mm. a lot of uh, crazy. But the difference was when we were growing up, you know, the gangs, if you were an athlete and a ball player, they looked out for yeah. you and protected you. Now, naturally, I grew up in the neighborhood and a lot of my boys, you know, they, they were in the gangs. But the ones that were in the gang, most of them was the serious hoopers. Uh, not us. <laughs> uh, some of them, you know, some of them, we tried to get to get their grades together so they could play on our team at Parker, but they just wouldn't do right uh, what they needed to do school wise. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, right in between there. So if, if you lived in the area and, and, and if you got caught in the wrong place in the wrong time, you mm. know, you just had to throw your hands. It, it, it was about these things. And and I tell mm -hmm. this story, I, I talk to a lot of kids now, and I tell them the difference when I was younger compared to what they go through now. When I yep. tell them when I was younger, if it was five guys coming down the street in the gang, and out of the five of them, if two of them had pistols, each pistol usually shot six times each. So if we dodged 12 bullets, we was good. <laughs> so I tell the kids, but nowadays, if five guys is coming down the street, at least four of them got pistols, not like guns, Absolutely. and they semi-automatic rifles, and each of those rifles are shooting at least 55 bullets each. So they have to guard dodge over 250, 300 bullets. And I'm like, look, that, that's the difference. So I kind of explain situations like that to kids. But growing up on 71st Street, right across the street from Hamilton Park, you know, baseball was my first love. And one thing about the park, even though everything that was going on around us, you know, I played baseball, basketball, mm -hmm. played a little football. We did tennis. We had the field house right there wood shop well we had everything we had archery downstairs and you know we wow, pretty man. much did everything so but but baseball was my first love a lot of people don't know i don't even know if you know this will but, i didn't uh, know that I, I played little league baseball from eight till i was 12 and then playing league from 13 to 15 i played two years of baseball in high school i played my freshman and sophomore year i was a pitcher Here's another one right there. That scar, you may or may not can see it. I threw uh -huh. so many curveballs, and I was taller that I, as years later, I had nerve damage. But I believe this was Tommy John surgery from when I played mm -hmm. little league and played baseball. But uh, baseball mm -hmm. was my first love, and uh, I, I was a pitcher. I played first base. Uh, I was being scouted in high school. I played freshman and sophomore year. But as you two know. Baseball season for public league in Chicago, when it comes around in May, it's still pretty cold outside. That's right. That's and, right. And, and after a while, I would rather be in a hot gym than <laughs> uh, uh, and then be out there on the cold baseball field. So I, I kind of got away from it and let it go. But at Hamilton Park, that's where I had all my mentors and stuff. Uh, my mother mm -hmm. raised me. I knew my father. My mother and father were separated. So I knew mm -hmm. my father, but I didn't know him. My father was a milkman. He used to come, give my mama money every week. He would come, and when it was time to pay for my insurance for baseball. So my father was in my life, but he wasn't in stuff. So my mother wore both hats. So most of my male guidance mm. and influence came from the people uh, in the parks, you know, my coaches. Uh, I, I played for uh, uh, the 7th District police team, and the 7th District at that time was on 63rd and Racine off of Halstead right there. And uh, Officer Clarence Sherrard and Jesse Ward, they they mm. came and got us in elementary school, and we were the 007 Royals. And we used to go <laughs> and we, what? Played, yeah, we played up uh, on Southtown YMCA, which was on 66 and uh, low back in the day. So under the viaduct, again, you come, one side was the disciples, the other side was the gangsters. So my whole life, I, I kind of went through that. 
But that's where we played at. That's what got me started playing ball then as I got uh, taller. Because when I was in sixth grade, I was all I was like six one. By the time I was in seventh grade, I was six <laughs> two. By the time I was in eighth grade, I was six three or six four. And when I was a freshman in high school, I had grown to six five. So I started on oh, damn. I started on varsity uh, in high school, and actually myself and Ricky Green, who went to Hirsch. Ricky Green, we're, absolutely. We're, we're the same year, her, and Ricky went to Hirsch, and I went to Parker High School. We were the two. Uh, we were the first two. Uh, freshman players to play varsity in the public league in Chicago to start on varsity, not to play. And we started all four years. So we were some of the first. Wow. And, and uh, I came up in the era and, and you heard of the Billy Harris's and the Mario Browns and Mickey Johnson and the Mickey Johnson's, the Daryl Minifields and all Darryl the Minifield. Oh, yeah. Ooh. I talked to Daryl the other day. I, he, I talked to many. Actually, I visited uh, out to New Mexico because when Daryl was coming out of high school, I was coming out of grammar school. But he went mm. to New Mexico, and I took a trip there after my – I was a junior in high school. See, back then, you could take trips anytime. I took 13 of them. And I went <laughs> I went out to New Mexico <laughs> with, with, with Daryl Minifield and Chester Fuller, who played at – uh yeah high school and and chester was a deadly shooter and and actually i talked to daryl the other day i i, I called him and uh because i had been thinking about him because many was a men uh he was a mentor to me so i started right there on 71st and i always say that's the real uh that's the real inglewood because right now you know they talk about 63rd street over by Market Park and by Western yeah. and over there. But back when right. I was growing up in the 60s, bro, we couldn't go over there. You know, right. white people didn't allow <laughs> us to go. Those were the same people when Martin Luther King came to Chicago. Martin Luther King said, these white people here are worse than the people in the South and stuff. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so this is so, you know, they talk where Derrick Rose and a lot of them come from now, but back then, Inglewood didn't extend that far. So far. 63rd yeah. and Halstead, that, that was where we shopped and got everything. So that, yep. and, and, <laughs> um, and that's where I came up, right there on 71st Street, in between Halstead and Wentworth and State Street. You didn't mess with so much, man. I'm like, man, I'm trying to write all this down. Because first of all, man, you threw some names out there that I remember you guys, and I know you, you probably don't remember this, Bo, but probably you, you remember the league. But y'all used to come also on um, playing the greens over there on Chicago Avenue. Uh, and you didn't notice either. But Billy, the kid Harris, that's my cousin. I didn't know that. Yes. I, so yes. so you still talk to Anthony? You still talk yes. to Anthony? Yeah, yes. Willie. Yes, I Willie Harris and, and Billy, though, those were those were my mentors. And and, and Billy, he, he taught me a lot in Billy used to always say when he found out I was going to Marquette, he said, I'm proud of you. And and a lot of people will be talking about, and they call Billy a playground legend. And I tell Absolutely. people, I like, I, but I tell them, Will, well, but, but Billy wasn't really a playground legend. See, a playground legend for us was somebody that could play that was great in the playground, but they would never go to school and take care of their schoolwork and just play outside of school, but see, Billy took care of his schoolwork, went to Northern Illinois, graduated from Northern Illinois, had a degree, worked in the business world. So even though Billy had the streets in him, Billy also had a lot of book sense. And let me tell you this mm -hmm. other story real quick. I've only saw one ABA game in my life. And my sophomore year at Marquette, we went out to San Diego to play San Diego State. And Billy was playing for the San Diego Conquistadors. And, and Lloyd and I were very close to Billy, and we knew he was out there. So we called him when we were out there. We went to his apartment. We went to the game to watch the Conquistadors play the San Antonio Spurs with George Gervin. And, and, and Billy didn't play. He didn't get into the game until the fourth quarter. And the fourth quarter, he came in, and five minutes, he had 14 points 
in five minutes in the fourth quarter. And, yeah, yeah. and, and, and Billy was an unbelievable talent. So, you know, for all those people that think Billy Harris was a playground legend, our definition yeah. of a playground legend was more of like an Arthur Civils or I'm sure we can think about some on the West side that were before y'all that came up with y'all that right. loved and just did work in the playgrounds, but they never would go to school. But Billy went to school. Billy had a college degree, but I didn't know that, Will. And, and yes. Billy and his big brother, Willie Harris, were my mentors along with the Mario Browns. And like I said, the Daryl Minifields and even the Dan Davises, oh. the Gene Fords, all of them, because I used to come on the West Side. We go all over the city. Sonny Parker used to come to Hamilton Park and play all the time. And like I said, if you was a ball player, you can go mm -hmm. anywhere and play. And, and if something crazy happens and go down and you got caught in the middle, then your inner city instincts would come in. But as far as, yeah. as, far as somebody <laughs> coming up to you, yeah, if somebody was to just come up to you, nobody was just coming up to you and start shooting because they respect the ball players and they love watching you. You said some things earlier, man, that's still just on my mind. First of all, Milkman. What's the Milkman? Explain to our listeners what the Milkman is. <laughs> my, my, my daddy was a Milkman. My daddy worked. <laughs> my daddy worked for Joe Lewis Milk Company. So you know, a lot of people. Some people that knew, you know, we used to signify a lot, and 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 I remember it was one guy that was from down on 39th Street. Uh, Lamont Gilmore that played at Phillips High School, and he was a few years before me. And we played in a lot of tournaments together. And, they, and the Parhams, you know, who was very close to Billy and them, and, and Lamont Gilmore, when he found out my daddy was the milkman, he used to call me the milkman and stuff. But I, when, when I was like 10 and 11 on Saturday morning, sometimes to get to my daddy, give me some extra money and get to hang out, I would go and do my milk routes with my father mm. on the milk truck. And he would go, but he worked for Joe Lewis Milk Company, which was on 67th, 62nd and Prairie back then. So that's where that name came from. And that's the why I would say that. Is, <laughs> is that. is that the Joe Lewis, the boxer? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He had Joe his own Lewis. milk? He had his own yeah. milk company? Yes, he did. And, and actually, it's funny because... Uh, I don't really do Facebook, Will. My wife put all that stuff on there. and I She is. Yeah, yeah. Candy on there all the time. So she put me on there saying that I need you. I like, Candy, listen, anybody I need to talk to, I have their phone number. So <laughs> she, she said this year, I'm going to put you on there. So that was her that did it. So I actually happened to see your message. So that's why I called you. So not too long ago, I was looking at something, and Daryl Minifield is on there all the time doing stuff. And Daryl Minifield put on there, my mama said, go get me some milk. And when you come back, you better have the Joe Lewis milk and not another type of milk company. So when I uh, heard that, I, I reached out to Daryl. I, I did learn how I didn't comment or write back. I know that once you're friends with people, you can actually call them. So I like, I'm going to call because see my hands with all that texting and punching yeah. in numbers. So I, I, I called Daryl after that because I hadn't talked to him and, and stuff. And I told him, I like, boy, well, I called him. He said, boy, I can't really hear you. I'm going to text you my number. So he sent me his number. So we talked and I said, I had to call you when I saw that because my daddy worked for Joe Lewis Bill Company and stuff. And, but, but Minnie was always uh, 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 one of my idols. He, he always, Billy, everybody older than me, Mario Brown, all of the things wow. that they were going through and the different things, they, they always enlightened me to make sure that I didn't make the same mistakes or get caught up in these streets and, mm. and do the wrong thing. So that's kind of why I turn out the way I am, you know, dealing with young people, you know, speaking with you too, even at a young age, sharing mm. my thoughts about what you need to do to be successful and, and you got to keep plugging and stuff. And, and then one other real quick thing, two other of my great mentors were one from the West Side. His name was Leon Hillard. I don't know if y'all, you may be yeah. too young to remember Leon. He went to McKinley High School, but he was uh, he was one of the original Harlem Globetrotters. 
And then the other one was Mel Davis. Mel used to run mm. Dunbar Park, and, and and Mel was also, and uh, when we were in, in, in college, we used to work with the Abe Saperstein Foundation in the summertime, and Leon mm. and, and, and uh, Mel was the ones that put it together, and they taught us how to go back to the neighborhood and share our story with the kids so they could see how we were able to become successful and, and that's how I became who I am. And that's why I do what I do with young kids because mm. Mel and Leon taught me how to give back. Mel and, and, Leon. And, and, and that's what you got. Leon Hillard and Mel Davis. And uh, okay. two of the best and uh, very good. One was from the South Side and Leon was from the West Side. And two great mm. individuals. Bo, you got such a, such a history, man. Such a, I mean... Have you ever just thought about who Bo Ellis is? I mean, have you just ever sat down and said, man, I have accomplished so much. I've done so much. Like, I'm Bo Ellis. Like, I, I've been going back, man, looking at all your stuff. Like, I saw some of your, your interviews, man, um, uh, from Shaka Smart being hired to, to uh, Al McGuire. I mean, just have you ever just thought about, man, how you just been placed in where you are and, has that ever really hit you? Well, you know, it, it has. And like I said, the, the main two individuals that, that taught me to be who I am are the two individuals I just told, told you about. They taught mm -hmm. me how to use my platform and to give back to the neighborhood. So, you know, I, mm -hmm. I think about it all the time. Uh, but, you know, that, that's what I do. And, and that's how I came up. And, uh, and, and, it were, and, and it was a lot of individuals that were gifted like me, blessed like me, ball players. But for mm -hmm. some reason or another, they fell mm -hmm. short. And, and I was able to learn from other individuals' mistakes. But I had a lot of people that took a special interest in me. And the other part of it, and I, and I tell these stories all the time because I talk to a lot of young people. And, and uh most of my things that I do now, I do it with elementary school kids because you got to catch them young nowadays. So you can get them third, fourth, and fifth grade. By the time they mm -hmm. get to sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, they hit the door running and stuff. So when, when I was younger, my, 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 my grammar school teachers, I was very blessed. Most of my elementary school teachers came from traditional black colleges, and yeah. they taught us well. And, and, and I was very blessed. So when I was in like fifth, sixth, and seventh grade, right, the, the years that you really molded, I had a lot mm -hmm. of teachers that came from traditional black colleges that set the table mm. for my life and stuff. And then on the flip side of it, I was very blessed and gifted. Like I say, I was a very good basketball player. You know, I could draw real well. I had art skills. Um, I, I just had a lot. And then the biggest thing that those uh, early elementary school teachers taught me was how to be successful in the classroom. And I'll never forget, mm. I had this one teacher, his name was W.W. W. Jackson, and he graduated from Morehouse College. And we all remember Uncle Ben. They, they, they banned Uncle Ben off the rice box now. But Mr. Jackson looked just like Uncle Ben. He had gray <laughs> hair. And it's Are you serious? Time. Yes, he did. And, and I'll never forget in seventh grade, I remember Mr. Jackson telling our class, he said, if you can learn to read and write, you can go to college and get a degree and be successful. He said, if you learn to read and understand what you're reading and then be able to write it back and explain to what you just read, he said, you can be successful in life and you can go to college and, and do whatever you want in life. And, and I'll never forget that. And, and it's always stuck with me in life. But mm. I've been, I've just had some great people that's been put in my life. And, you, you know, I think about it all the time, Will. And I think about it, I still have a lot of work to do. So the more people, people that I'm able to touch, you know, that's what's important to me. And, and having two young men like you two, you know, being mm -hmm. able to tell a story about, my, uh, 
the, the, our relationship in the early years when you were trying to figure out who you wanted to be and where you wanted to go. Right. You know, that's what it's all about. And, you know, you know, leaving Marquette and taking the Chicago State job, a lot of people said, you know, why you want to do that? Well, Chicago State was home. I had been at Marquette for 10 years. I was like 45 years old. And Coach McGuire said, Bo, it's your time. So, you know, I knew that was one of the hardest jobs in America. But, you know, the original Chicago State, I don't know if you and Arthur know this, Will, was right there on 68th and Stewart also. So where the new rope city is, that used yeah. to be that used to be Chicago Teachers College, Parker Elementary School, and then Parker High School was on the backside by the railroad track. So right. Chicago right. State was right by me. It was a no-brainer. I don't regret it. Uh, didn't have a whole lot of success, but I did have a lot of success because all of those kids that I coached and touched in their lives, right. they're all doing well in life. They call me all the time to talk to me. To me, that's being successful. That That's better than winning the national championship or, or anything that I could have ever done in my life. That's more important to me. So that's what it's all about to me is giving back yeah. and all the things that were shared with me. It's so this time for me to share with you too. And now you getting older. So you're in that position. You're dealing with a lot of people. So my stories, right. now you see it with yours. You make them intertwine and you share those stories and, and then that's how the family tree continues to grow and prosper down the line. <laughs> My goodness. A living legend. Oh, well, uh, let's go back to your basketball days, man. You playing in Chicago, playing against all these greats. I always wanted to ask you this, because I don't think I ever asked you this, man. When you was coming out, I know you chose Marquette. What other schools were you were you looking at, though? Like, how, how did you not go to DePaul? How did you not go to Illinois or UIC? How did they let you get out of the city? Well, UIC, I don't even think was existing then, but um, but it's funny you say about Illinois and DePaul. One reason I didn't uh, go to DePaul, one, I didn't want to stay home. I wanted to get out of Chicago. And mm. it was another guy along that came from my high school. I told you about Mario Brown, but another mm. player that played with Mario Brown, his name was Albert Burks. And Albert Burks and Billy Harris were the two leading scorers in the state their senior mm. year. And that's when I was in ninth grade. And Al Burks went to DePaul. And then the Bur Burks was a kid from down south, a good young man, 6'6", country boy, good person, wasn't out in the streets. And he went to DePaul. And his senior year, something happened between him and Ray Meyer and Ray Meyer mm. kicked him off the team his senior year. So when that happened, I said, well, if 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 Ray Myers couldn't deal with a person like Al Burks, I don't know damn well. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I didn't go to DePaul. Now, I told you back then, you could take as many trips as you wanted to. I remember going down to the state tournament in Champaign because it was still in El at Illinois, Back then, mm -hmm. so it was my sophomore year. So I came 69. So this is about 70, 71. And uh, I was mm. down there. My high school coach took me. And I was hanging out with Nick Weatherspoon and Billy Connors. Those were two of the uh, Illinois stars. Mm. Uh, uh, Nick was from St. Louis and Billy Connors from there. And uh, I, I just saw, I saw a, a lot of racist things. Because remember, I'm talking about the late 60s, early 70s. So... And, and I'm talking about I came up with the Black Panthers and all of that. And, and when I yeah. was on campus, I, I saw a couple of things down in Illinois that I don't like, I didn't like. And I'll tell you the one thing, uh, Nick Weatherspoon and, and Billy Connors were showing me around campus and we were mm -hmm. walking by the dorms and somebody started throwing water balloons out of the dorms and they almost hit us. So Nick and Billy we went up in the dorms and they went and found, <laughs> they, went and found the, they found the white kids that was throwing the balloons at them. And, 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 they, and they didn't jump on them or beat them. So, but they slapped them upside the head. <laughs> and, 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 and so when, when, when I saw that, and then the other thing, Will, Illinois 
wasn't, uh, you know, they, they were still trying to find who they were back then. Mm -hmm. So I had so many mm -hmm. other colleges that I was interested in. But to answer your question, so uh, coming out, I visited Purdue. Mm -hmm. uh, I went out to USC. I visited mm -hmm. Kansas. I visited oh. Texas A&M because Mario Brown went to Texas A&M from Chicago. So that's how I did it. And actually, that's how Sonny Parker ended up there. And Mike Johnson, who's Eddie Johnson's older brother from Westinghouse, and Mike played at Austin the uh -huh. same year. Mike went there and stuff, but I wasn't going way down to Texas and stuff. <laughs> uh, Memphis State, uh, I visited Memphis State. That, that was uh, the, the year after they lost to UCLA. So they had... Uh, Larry Fitch, uh, Larry Keenan. So they did. Mm -hmm. So those were some of the schools. I used to mm -hmm. go out to Maryland when I was at Marquette to work their basketball camps just to play. And Bernard King, everybody used to come to camp and work. And they would fly us out, take care of us, pay us $100, and we'd be there for a week and just play. So, But that was Damn. the reason I had no interest in DePaul or, or, or Illinois. And, and I wanted to get away. And and and, yeah. and I also said, I always would say that I was going to go to school somewhere where it was warm. And then <laughs> once Al McGuire and them came in, I ended up to go to a school that was in northern Siberia, going to Milwaukee. Right. Uh, so, right. uh, but, but, uh, but that was it. And, but, once I, <laughs> but, but once Al McGuire came in, I got to meet him. Coach was very different. And I'm going to tell you what, what, what the difference was. When when Coach McGuire came in and he saw me and Coach Raymond saw me play and I finally came to visit and Coach sat down with me, the first thing Coach McGuire told me and my mother when he finally met my moms is he said, the most important thing to me is that you get your degree from Marquette University. And he said, we will pay for your education until you get your degree, no no matter mm. how long it takes. So if you go to the pros and you fall wow. short, you can always come back. And he said, that's the most important thing to me. And a lot of people ask me this all the time. That's what separated Al McGuire from everybody else, because everybody else is telling me about how good I was and mm. how good a player I was and what I'm doing. I'm like, I ain't worried about that. Yeah. I know I can play. I like long as I know that you're gonna give me the same opportunity as everybody else. I don't want mm -hmm. anything added to me. I let my game speak for me. But when Coach told my mother that I'm gonna make sure your son graduates from Marquette, he said, "Right now, you don't understand what I'm telling you, but that's the mm -hmm. biggest thing that I can ever do for you." And I can say right now, mm. to today, that that is that degree has made meant more to me than anything I've been through. You know, the three years being in the NBA and, and all mm -hmm. of that, you know, my coaching. So that's why I went to Marquette and not DePaul or not Illinois. And UIC well, hadn't really stepped out there. That was still in those early years. It was still developing over there. But that, that was the reason I went to Marquette. And, and, uh, and I, I tell a lot of kids right today, and I'll say on this program, I'm in like, eight different Hall of Fames, my number retired, and, and all of the accolades mm. and all of the things that uh, I've been able to achieve in life. When I talk to these kids, I tell them, you know what the most important and my biggest accomplishment is? I tell them that I graduated and got a degree from Marquette University. Because the first thing I tell them is, Parker High School did not prepare me for Marquette University. I went to an all-black high school from Inglewood mm. in Chicago. Now I was a good, I took care of my schoolwork. I did what I was supposed to do, but the, the, the type of courses that we were getting at Parker, that didn't pre prepare me for Marquette. So once I got to Marquette, mm. you know, I had to learn how to, to, to do what I had to do in the classroom. I had to learn to get tutors to get help. And it took me about to my junior year. And I told Will the story, you know, it takes a while to adjust. So, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know that, that that was the important thing to me. And I told the kids that degree from Marquette, that's my single biggest accomplishment in life. It's bigger than anything I did. You know, national championships, 
or NBA first round draft choice, all of that is secondary to getting that degree mm. from Marquette because that's what I'm most proud of. And I think my mom's is proud of it. And one other thing to answer your question, Will, when I did go to Marquette, my mom had a chance to finally come and watch me play. As good as I was at Parker High School for four years, starting on varsity, all city, four years, all city, all state, my mother never saw me play in high school wow. because we played at wow. 3.15 in the afternoon and she worked for Department of Children and Family Services. She worked for DCFS, so she could never come to the games when I was in high school. So once I got to Marquette, the four years that I spent at Marquette, I don't think my mother maybe missed two or three games because of bad weather. She was at every mm. single game. And that's wow. one reason why I stayed in school all four years, because my name was mm. on the hardship list my sophomore and junior year. So I took mm. my name off. I was the first big man to stay all four years at Marquette, and we won a national championship because if Jimmy, Jimmy mm. Jones – would have stayed all four years. He left after sophomore year in the middle of the season. Coach McGuire told him to leave. He signed with the ABA. Uh, Larry McNeil left early as a junior because if he would have stayed at my freshman year, the back line would have been Maurice Lucas, Larry McNeil from New York, and Bo Ellis from Chicago, and Lucas from Pittsburgh. Mm. So I took him. So all of them all left her. So if they all stay in school, all four years, I guarantee Marquette and Coach McGuire would have had at mm. least three or four national championships. So, you know, that, that that was the biggest thing. So, you know, my thing is that degree, Coach was right. He never blessed it. And I think that's one of the reasons why Coach and I had the type of relationship that we had because I was the first big guy to stay all four years for him. And, and because I was able to stay – you know, we, we put some good people together around me and, and we were able to win it all. And, and coach never let me forget that. And, and that's one of my that's uh, one of my fondest memories and my, my biggest accomplishments in life, bigger than anything mm -hmm. else that I ever did in basketball. My goodness. Marquette, Marquette. So let, let's stay at Marquette, though. I mean, what was your first day like on campus? This is a kid from 71st Street and. You know what I'm saying? On the south side of Chicago, you go to Marquette. I, I mean, what is it like? Like your first day, like walking on campus, like. Well, you know, everybody know who you are. You the man. But it was a little intimidating because I was around a lot of white people. And again, you were shy? No, no, I, was, I wasn't shy. I was just leery. I was just watching them because, you know, yeah. again, the Black Panthers was becoming big back then. And, you know, and uh -huh. even my. My teachers in black history and all them, they used to talk about the Europeans and, and the white folks and stuff. So I, I kind of stayed on my toes, but, you know, it was a little intimidating, but everybody embraced me with open hard arms. And, you know, one thing about being an athlete mm. when you're black, even back in the day, when, when you're black and you're an athlete, you know, sometimes white folks look at us a little different. They don't treat us like everybody else you know, every other black student on campus be because who you are and you're mm -hmm. a star. So I understood that totally, but, you know, it was great. Yep. Marquette was huge back then. Basketball was big. You know, we had, a, they had, a, and we had a lot of other inner city uh, ball players that, that were, uh, you know, already on campus that had already been there. You know, the Dean Mimages from New York, the George Thompson's from New York, you know, like I said, Jimmy Jones was from Racine, Wisconsin. Uh, Bob Lackey was from Evanston, Illinois. So they were all before me and stuff. So, you know, but it was great being on campus. They always treated me like a king, always treated me with respect. Anytime I needed some help with anything, mm -hmm. they, they were always there, you know, to help me. And, and again, the other thing is when I first went to Milwaukee, I don't know if I told Will this, you know, Nazis were still big in Milwaukee back then because that was a German town. And uh, that first year on wow. campus in like 10, 1973, the police still was riding motorcycles that had uh, German Nazi swastik signs on their bikes and stuff. So, what? You know, oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. But, but, you know, Milwaukee was a city. It was right downtown. 
So I would go into the neighborhood. I had I had met people from the neighborhood. And then we had a lot of, you know, black kids that would commute. They didn't live on campus, but they lived in the city. So they come back and forth. And then we had the EOP program, the educational opportunity program for first generation graduates. So, you know, you had a lot of, uh, you know, I had a lot of inner city kids came from all around the country that was there. So, you know, but uh, it, it, it was a wake up call. But, you know, I, I, I found I, I learned to adjust. And, you know, the uh, other thing is they knew who I was. So, you know, I was treated mm. a little different than your normal black man. How did you overcome that intimidation piece, though? Because so many, particularly when you go to an all white school, it's, 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 you can struggle in that area. How did you overcome the intimidation piece? Well, the, the the biggest intimidation part of it was probably in the classroom part and, you know, being able to keep up and, you know, knowing that uh, I wasn't really on the same level as far as being taught where most of these students learn coming out. So I just learned to adjust. And when I needed help or I wanted to reach out to somebody, I wasn't afraid to ask for help and, and to get tutoring or even ask one of those white kids that was in my class that loved to talk to me about basketball. I would say that, but I'm like, that's <laughs> right. right. I'm like, yeah, but I need you. Can, can you help me? Uh, and when we study, so, you know, I just learned, I had good common sense and, you know, and, and I, I just mm-hmm. used that and, and that's how I was able to overcome. I wasn't afraid to ask for help when I needed help and no matter who it was that, you know, that I asked to help me. So, that, that was the biggest thing and the biggest adjustment. Mm-hmm. So that's how it worked for me. Now, when you at Marquette, I mean, because me and Will, when we went on, on our visits, you know, they always used to, uh, you know, wow you with the arena that they play in and stuff like that. Was Marquette facilities, like, up to par, like, better than the visits that you had previously went on? And was you, like, at Marquette and, like, man, I like this arena. I like our locker room. I like, a, you know what I'm saying? Absolutely not. No, no. The one thing that the one thing that you said was, was the difference is that we did play in the Milwaukee Arena, and that's where the Milwaukee Bucks played. And y'all probably saw it because I think when y'all came up that we were we were at the Bradley Center then. Were we at the Bradley Center yet? Yeah, we all we were still at the Mecca. Yeah, we was in the Bradley Center, but um we played we played some games in the Mecca, but we were primarily in the Bradley Center. Well, but being, but knowing that I was going to a town that had an NBA team, and I, I knew that mm-hmm. uh, our players used to play against the Bucks all the time, and being in a pro city, that was very important. But as far as the facilities on campus, the old gym, and, and all yeah. of that, they were, they were probably the worst facilities out of any yes. colleges that I had, I had went to, but... You know, what? Uh, my, my <laughs> thing wasn't the fancy, you know, colleges, uh, they, they had a high graduation rate. They were a top flight team. And the other thing is, you know, when I was coming up, they didn't have a whole lot of uh, national televised games. They had all they had a lot of regional games. So you would get mm. games on Saturday afternoon and Marquette was always on regional games. So they were on TV that way. So that was also very intriguing to me. But the fact that we played in a pro city, a pro town, played with the Bucks all the time. And once I got there, I, I got to know Kareem. Uh, Oscar was there for a while, Bobby Dandridge, uh, Dick Garrett, all of them, because when we were playing in the off season, either they came down on campus to play with us at the old gym, or we would go mm-hmm. over to their practice facility at Concordia College, which is up on 35th Street, back then so though that was the mm. biggest thing but but it it definitely wasn't the locker room or the old gym and, and the facilities but in, in essence those facilities compared to what i was used to at parker high school that, that was a luxury so that's how i kind of looked at it <laughs> yes, yes, yes. so it still yeah. was a luxury compared to where i was coming from so you know, because you remember we uh, and uh, at Parker, we, we still had 10 backboards and stuff. The first team in our conference back in the 60s and 70s to get glass backboards in our conference was Dunbar. And then I think some years later, DuSable finally did it. But everybody else mm-hmm. had them 
fan shaped tan backboards. This is fan shaped. I hated them. Yeah, I, I love them because see, the one at my school, it had a dead spot on it, and and I knew how to use the glass, and I knew the one spot if I shot it and banked it off, it would go in every time. So I guess that's why I ended up averaging twenty eight points a game. And stuff. Right, right, right. And yeah. Yeah, so that, that that's how that all took uh, place. So let me ask you about this, man. Obviously, you and Coach Al McGuire, your legacy runs deeper than the basketball court. What was your relationship with Coach? We had a great relationship. Uh, you know, Coach was a, a master psych, uh, psychologist. Uh, Coach was able to, uh, you, you know, relate in, in, in all ways. And, and, and Coach also... You know, coach just told the truth about everything. So, you know, we had a tremendous relationship. Uh, mm. he, you know, uh, he, he respected what we did and where we came from, and he understood that. And then uh, coach just, you know, told it like it was. You know, he always kind of left a rope out there for you to hang yourself and stuff. So, you know, <laughs> and if you did what you were supposed to, mm. which was go to class, take care of your schoolwork, and do all of that. But as years went on and uh, after coach left and I came back and, and I was uh, coaching, you know, uh, back in the eighties and the nineties, I used to see coach a lot. He was just starting to get into television. So, you know, we used to talk a lot and that's how we developed the relationship we had. And uh, we, we had a lot of fun, but, but a good man and uh, well-respected and uh, just a uh, unbelievable human being. And, and uh, I loved him better as a person than I did as a coach because he was <laughs> his coach was crazy as hell. But he could never make me mad. He could never make me mad. He could never make me mad. And he used to like to, you know, he liked to make his players argue with him. Now Lloyd Walton and him used to go at it, but Lloyd was his point guard, and Lloyd Lloyd was yes, but but Lloyd and Coach they used to argue. But that's what Coach liked and stuff. He could never make me mad enough. To argue with him, I would just look at him and just laugh and shake my head because he would he would just say something crazy and I like man I just shake my head and, and he would look at me and say but why you look at me that way and I wouldn't say anything keep my mouth closed I just shake my head and just listen but you know just just an unbelievable person an unbelievable teacher and uh just a uh, just great person to be around and and a great mentor and taught me how to teach and give back also. Did you guys stay in touch like after he got out of out of coaching and before he passed away and all that? Like what did y'all oh, 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 oh yeah, because remember I went back to Marquette in nineteen eighty eight to start coaching. So I was there from eighty eight to ninety eight. And uh that's right when coach was starting to do his broadcasting. So I was living back in Milwaukee. Then uh the family, you know my my two kids, my oldest daughter, the one I was telling y'all about mm -hmm. that I lost, Nikki, when I went back in 88, she was going into sixth mm. grade. So she was there sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And then she graduated, went to Pius High School in Milwaukee, and then she came to Marquette. So all of those years, uh, I was back there. So me and Coach had a tremendous relationship. And a lot of times, uh, at, at one time, uh, when we first went into a conference, he was doing the conference mm. game. So a lot of times if it was uh, a team and it was my scout game, he would call me and come by the office. He, we would sit down, watch tape together. I would go over, you know, the points of, of what we were going to talk about and, and what we were going to work on with the scouting report, and he would sit down mm. with me. So, you know, I, I had the chance to spend the later years with him and then – I came back to Chicago State in 1998, and uh, and Coach got sick back around. Well, he was sick back, you know, in the day, but he never really told anybody. But I could see it. And, and what Coach had, Coach had a rare form of leukemia. He had a mm. blood disease and stuff. But you know, he said, but I could look at him and tell something wasn't right. right. For a long time, he wouldn't say anything, and and then maybe around. 2000, he finally came out and said what was going on. Back in about 2003, Coach had started to take a turn for the worse, and George Thompson called me, and they had put Coach in the hospice. And George Thompson, myself, Euless Perry Payne, Robert Bird, who went to Phillips, who was Coach's last recruit, 
we went to coach, we went to see coach at the hospital and, and to talk to him. And what would happen is uh, he had to get these blood transfusions every day. The blood transfusions would kind of wipe out the leukemia for a while during the course of the day. So he would feel pretty good. So you would have to catch him early in the morning when you could get him and he was feeling good. So we went back and spent some time with him and coach got to telling stories mm-hmm. and, and then, and when he was telling some stories about the past, he was telling a few about Lloyd and a few other ones, and he started laughing, and he was laughing so hard. He told us, he said, we got to stop this, he said, because this laughing is making me hurt. Nah. But he was having a good time. And I'm going to tell you this story. Uh, when we went to see him at the hospital, when you know he was kind of on his deathbed, we walked into the room, the four of us, and we like, Coach, how you doing? And he was laying on the bed. But he had his back turned to the door, kind of looking out the window, and he had the radio on, and Nat King Cole was on the radio. I don't remember what song it was. And when we started talking, he heard our voices. So he finally started, he got up, started to turn around, and he saw it was us, and he started smiling, and he said, yeah. He said, I knew y'all was coming. That's why I had Nat King Cole on the box to sing for us. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, until the day Coach uh, died, you know, he, he was tremendous to be around. And, and like I said, you know, for some of them early years in his broadcast, and he was doing our conference game. So he was on the road with us a lot. So we would have beers and, and, and things. So that's how we became even closer. And and uh, that, that, that was my blessing. And mm-hmm. that was our great relationship. So, Bo, tell us about this thing with, with Coach McGuire also on this level, too, because I found some stuff out that I did not know about Bo Ellison. That was, I didn't know that fashion design was your passion. I didn't know that that's what you wanted to do. So, in your recruiting, give us the story how, because Marquette ain't got no fashion design school. Well, I see, I could draw real well. That's another gift that God blessed me with. I, as a kid, you know, I, I could draw, I had some serious art skills. And I really was interested in architectural drafting. So that's why I visited so many schools. And a lot of those schools that I mentioned, like Purdue, USC, they did have architectural drafting. So when Coach McGuire finally we got in and, and I pretty much knew I was going there, he asked me, what did I want to major in? And I said, fashion designing. And he looked at me. He didn't really say anything, but I could tell how he was looking. Like, like, like what this kid from the south side of Chicago, black high school, <laughs> won't know about fashion designing. So coach didn't really know how to answer that. So he looked at me. He said, said, Bo, let me think about this. I don't know. He, he said, give me a while. Let me check on it. So what they did do is he had Coach Raymond's check and Mount Mary College in Milwaukee, which was an all-girls school with nuns, they had the best fashion designing program in the state of Wisconsin. So what Coach promised me was, he said that uh, after my first year at Marquette, because he wanted me to get acclimated to being at Marquette first Mm -hmm. without trying to go to Mount Mary to take the courses. So they were able to work it out where I was able to take some designing courses at Mount Mary and they would mm. transfer back to Marquette towards my degree. So mm. he said, Bo, wow. we'll put that together for you. Second year, I want you to get acclimated, get used to Marquette first year. So I like, that was good, which is the best thing I did. And then sophomore year, they uh, put it together. Uh, uh, I had a few classes. I had a couple of designing classes. I had a nun as a teacher, and you think I was intimidated by going to an all-white campus. I'm over here at a Catholic Jesuit college, all women, <laughs> only about two or three or four black women going to the school. A couple of them was in my designing class, and I'm the only male student. I have a nun as my teacher. And I got a lot of people that say, boy, you was going crazy at that all girls school. I'm like, man, I didn't talk to nobody. I did my schoolwork. When I was done, I got back in the car and I went back on campus. I, I like, I, I wasn't there. So 
uh, that's where the fashion designing and that's where it came in. So what a lot of people don't know, I only did that for one year. So I did it for two semesters. And after that, I, I realized that, you know, trying to play ball and take care of my uh, schoolwork at Marquette mm -hmm. was uh, enough. It was overbearing and it was just too hard to try to do it. But they did it. I got a lot of publicity for it. And mm. then, you know, later we got the uniforms designed and that one that's on Will's wall to the right, to the to the left of him, to our right. Mm -hmm. That was the ones we wore my senior year and stuff. So I did uh, get a chance to design the uniforms and, and all of that from, you know, my creativity with art and being able to draw. Yeah, give we all love, I love to hear that, how that happened. Well, Marquette would always get new uniforms every year before the tournament. This is even way before I got there. I mean, Marquette was noted for the Bumblebee uniforms and they, they had all, they always had classic uniforms. And, and Coach McGuire, he was also uh, the, the president of this company called Sandit Metlis, who used to make the uniform. Mm. So uh, every year around tournament time, we would always get a new uniform. So after freshman year, it had to be, yeah, it had to be freshman year because Lloyd and Lloyd Walton and I were roommates my freshman year. That was the only time we lived together. And the next year, uh, that uh, before the tournament, Lloyd went to Coach McGuire and said, Coach, he said, won't you let Bo design the uniforms? And uh, wow. Coach kind of looked at us and looked at me and kind of smirked. He said, okay, sure. He said, Bo, put something together. And let me know. So Lloyd and I go back to the dorms uh, that night and I sit down, I get some colored pencils and I'm messing around, drawing up different things and getting creative. Let Lloyd look at it. What you think? And Lloyd said no. So I finally put together everything, put some uh, color schemes together. Lloyd and I go back to coach's office. Mm -hmm. The next day we walk in, I put it on the desk. He looks at it and he goes, hmm. Say, Bo, this is pretty good. This is interesting. He said, let me take this to the people at Medlis and let me get back to you and we'll go from there. And then they got back to me and I kind of collaborated with the people from uh, from Medlis. And the thing is, I, I didn't like keeping my shirt in my pants. I, I didn't like tucking in. I was always uncomfortable for me. Even in high school, I would always pull my shirt out and wear my pants, uh, shirt out of my, my my pants. And actually, Earl Tatum, who was my teammate that was the year before me, he used to do it also. So uh, that's how we became, that's how we came up with the concept uh, outside the pants, uh, the no tuck part, uh, untuck part. And, and that's how that whole mm. thing uh, transpired. But it was Lloyd's idea. I put it together. Once I did it, coach now, the only thing up until the day that Coach died, I used to say, Coach, you didn't tell me I got to get a patent on that. I'd be rich today. I wouldn't have to go through a lot of this. That's right. And I have to. Man, Coach's response was always, you say, they're still giving you credit for it today, aren't they? So, you know, that that's how that all happens. And and then, you know, from that, you know, the the 30 for 30 came out with the kid, Danny Pudi, who's a market uh -huh. alum. He came to me. And uh, he put the 30 for 30 together for me. And he did the show, uh, and, and mine was a short, and it's still on the computer right today. Anybody can still go and pull it up on yeah. ESPN.com slash 30 for 30. So that's how that's how the whole idea came about. Now, uh, even though I never got any money, I'm still I'm working. It's coming up on 50 years now for my championship, and I've drawn up a throwback one already. I, I had it in this book going back when I was a coach at Chicago State. Them teams you played for, man, first of all, y'all style was different. Y'all, I mean, y'all dressed differently. You guys had, um, I mean, from the untucked uniforms, in a lot of ways, y'all was kind of like the bad boys before the bad boy. Absolutely. How was that viewed at Marquette? Well, you know, that that, that that was that was because of Coach McGuire's image and stuff. But that goes way before, even before I got there. You know, uh, remember I said Bob Lackey from Evanston, Illinois? Y'all may not remember, but Bob, they called the Black Swan, who was from Evanston, and they had won uh, a state championship when he was in school in like 66 or, oh no, no, 
Bob would have been like 68 or something like that. So uh, uh, they they were bad boys before I got there because uh, that one year, they, a couple years before I got there with Jimmy Jones, Bob Lackey, Dean Miminger, George Frazier, who was another New York City uh, guy, they got into a big fight with uh, the University of Minnesota. That was Jim Brewer, Dave Winfield, Clyde Turner, oh, yeah. and Luke, uh, Luke Whitty, uh and then, so they had a controversy with them. And then they had another fight with South Carolina even before I, I got there. You know what's up. So no, Marquette was known as the bad boys way before I, I got there and stuff. But but that was that was the image. But you know, we we, we took the shape and form of our coach because Coach McGuire was considered, you know, a bad boy because he'd get all the texts, he would holler and scream. He'd get after the referees. He, he would do whatever he had to do but to, to protect his players. And, and and Coach was considered a renegade. And the kids that he recruited mm-hmm. in the neighborhoods we came from, and one of mm-hmm. the things Coach used to always say is, I never recruit a kid that has grass in his front yard. So ah. <laughs> I, can, I can definitely tell you my building that I lived in, we didn't have any grass in my front yard. That was for sure. So so that's how that whole thing came about. I mean, because I was telling Will because we wasn't able to uh, have our jerseys untucked. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, you know, uh, let's see, uh, 77. So Mark Aguirre and them wore them in high school because I saw a picture I'm yep. marking them. So after a while, the NCAA banned them. But they abandoned a couple yep. uniforms that Marquette had. Marquette had this bumblebee style, you know, back in the uh, 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 late 60s that the NCAA wouldn't allow. Those was the ones that they had stripes around them. Stripes, we were probably I'm looking at them. Because he went to school. Yeah, you also, you know what I'm talking about. So those uniforms were banned. The NCAA banned those uniforms. And then some years after... We came out with the untucked ones some years later. They banned them and said, no, everybody has to take it, tuck in their uniforms and, and stuff. So oh. that, that's how they – and Coach McGuire, you know, he had some run-ins with the NCAA. You know, the year that uh, Marquette won the NIT championship, Coach turned down the bid to the NCAA because he didn't like the region that they were sending them to. And then back then – People don't realize there was only 32 teams in the NCAA tournament back then. So uh, mm-hmm. coach, coach didn't like the fact where the NCAA was sending them every year. And even once I came, it seemed like all the time they would always put us in the same region it, it, with Kentucky. So at some point mm. we had to run and, and face Kentucky. So coach was a little pissed off with the NCAA so he turned down that bid that year, I think it was 1970, that they won the NIT. And then all of the time that I was in school, especially uh, the year that we won the national championship and we had lost seven games that year, and Coach was a little afraid that the NCAA was going to come back and get them and not give us a bid because of what had happened a few years before. Mm. So... And we had lost seven games. And, and again, we were independent, you know, so we weren't in the conference. So we had to get an at-large bid. And and mostly, you know, teams that were in conference, uh, conferences, whoever won the conference usually got an NCAA bid. So it was tough. And I can tell you this, I talk about this all the time. The year of 73, my, my first uh, national championship game that we lost to NC State and David Thompson uh, North Carolina State won the ACC conference, but the University of Maryland, who was ranked in the top five, failed to uh, qualify, so they didn't even make it to the NCAA tournament. And they had John Lucas, Mo Howard, wow. Lenny Elmore. Uh, they had uh, Tommy McMillan. So they had all of them, and they didn't even make it to the NCAA tournament that year. Mm. So senior year, when we struggled a little bit and down the stretch, we didn't really get the call to say that we were going to get into the NCAA because we had already had lost six games going into the last five games of our season. So we had to go on the road at Virginia Tech, Creighton, Mm -hmm. Michigan, and we played two other teams, so we beat, uh, we beat we beat four of them, and then we were playing uh, 
we beat Creighton was also right there to to go and at the time Creighton had two Chicago players. We were all in the same class. Mm. Cornell Smith and Robert Scrutchins, who both played at Mount Carmel High School with Lloyd. So they both were at Creighton, who were two serious players. So Creighton and us, we were right on the edge. We were both independent. And we both needed that game to possibly get in. Mm. So we beat Creighton. It, it was a Saturday afternoon. We beat Creighton in Omaha. Then we got on the plane and we had to go and play Michigan that Saturday on the nationally televised game in, in uh, Ann Arbor. So we mm. were playing Michigan. And at halftime of the Michigan game, somebody, uh, Hank, uh, Hank and Check or somebody, they had said that we had got the NCAA bid at halftime. And Coach was a little scared that the mm. NCAA was going to stick it to him. So before the game was over, we knew that it was going, and Michigan ended up beating us that day 61-60. to 60. And uh, that was our oh. seventh loss. And then we, go in, then we go into the NCAA tournament. We win all five games, and we're the national champs. So that's how that whole thing went down wow. and stuff. So. And I want to talk about that too, man. That that championship run, that was that was such an unusual year. First, you get the let's start with the fact that Coach McGuire was like, "This is it for him." How how did y'all receive that news? And and even at the time that he gave y'all that news, what what was going on through your mind? Well, he called us in early in the season, and and, and first when he called us in to come downtown to eat lunch at a place, we knew something was wrong because that was out of the ordinary. <laughs> so when he told us, you, you know, we we like, all right, we didn't think much about it. It didn't change anything about how we did things because we we was a winning program. We we were coming off a 28-2 and two season where Marquette and Indiana mm. was 1-2 and two in the nation that whole year, and we end up playing Indiana uh, in the Elite Eight to get to the Final Four. And at that time, they still, they I think they were still, uh, they were 30 and 0, and we were like 20, we were 28 and 1 back then. So we mm -hmm. had to play each other to, to get to the Final Four. So nowadays, that wouldn't even happen. So, yeah. you know, we were coming off a fantastic year. We knew how good we were. Plus, you know, the uh, seven games that we lost that year, there was only one team that actually really beat us. It was one of the few games that I lost at home. Might have been the only game I lost at home in my four years. Wichita State came in with uh, Cheese Johnson, who was a New York City kid, and uh, Bob Elmore, who was Lenny Elmore's little brother. Bob was like 6'10", about 250, was a beast. And uh, Gene Smithson, who used to be at Illinois State, what was their yeah. coach itself? You remember that name? Mm -hmm. So coach mm -hmm. missing and they came in and they beat us pretty good. That was my senior year. Actually, it was senior night. I got thrown out of that game because they put a boy, <laughs> they put a boy in the game. They put this white kid in the game just to hack me and to frustrate me. <laughs> that old okie doke move and I fell yeah. for it. Yeah. He punched, he punched me in the back. And I elbowed him in the neck, and then he swung and he hit me, and I retaliated, and they threw us both out the game. So oh, I got wow. it there. So that was the only that was the only game I ever had been thrown out in college. It was senior night. My folks, my family it was like thirty of my family, and everybody was at the game. <laughs> so they ended up beating us and, and stuff. So, but every other team that we lost to that year, Detroit, DePaul, finally beat us for the first time, and. In the four years I was there, they beat us in a double overtime game in Milwaukee. First time Ray Myers had ever beat a coach. Uh, then a couple other games. Detroit beat us on a buzzer beater. That's when Dick Vitale was there. They had John Long and Terry Durod. So they had a whip. I think Louisville beat us by two points that year. So all of the games that we had lost, you know, the year before that, or, or that, that particular year, senior year, were all pretty close games, so we knew how good we were. And and uh, coach announcing that he was leaving for for me personally, it, it didn't matter because it was my senior year too. So we all wanted to go out on top. Mm -hmm. So you know, we we just say, all right, coach is leaving, but you know, we're gonna do what we do. We play to win. We play to destroy everybody. So we just went by uh, by everything as like uh, business as usual. 
one of the things, man, that I, I recognize about your teams, not only did y'all have one legendary coach, your assistant coaches were legendary. I mean, you played for some great assistant coaches. Who, who are all those guys? Well, Hank Ramis and Rick Majerus, they, they were tremendous basketball minds. And, mm. you know, you look, you look nowadays, you look over there and coaching, even when you was there, we, were, we had like five or six coaches. It was only three of them. And uh, remember, when I came in 1973, Rick Majerus was really just starting to get into the business because Rick is, Rick is only a few years really older than me. I'll be 67 in August. So Rick was just a little older than me. So Rick was pretty much still new to the profession. Mm. But, but Hank Raymond's was an unbelievable basketball mind. And, and one thing I always respect about Coach uh, McGuire, he always gave Coach Raymond's his props. Now, I was a college coach for 17 years. I worked under four different head coaches mm -hmm. at Marquette. I, I, I know I had a lot to do with a lot of the successes that those coaches had because I know for a fact a head coach is only as good as the people that surround him and the coaches that you have with. And one thing that Coach McGuire always did, he always gave Coach Raymond's his props for how important he was to what we did and to how uh, important he was to our success. And how you used to always say, uh, without Hank's, you know, input and, and drive, we would never be where we are. So mm. uh, that's one thing that always, but, but a tremendous basketball mind and had a lot of success and great teacher uh, prepared us like no other. And, you know, right today, I still have a lot of the philosophies that I learned from, you know, Hank and, and even Rick. But Rick was still pretty young uh, and new to it when I first came to college. And then later on, when Doc Rivers and uh, all of those came on, you know, later mm -hmm. in like mm -hmm. 83, 84, that's when Rick started to come into his own. But mm -hmm. uh Rick was a great basketball man because he was around Hank Raymond's and Al McGuire and, and Hank taught him a lot. And, you know, it's just unfortunate that all of them are gone today. And, you oh, know, the, yeah. those, those are, those were some, some, uh, some truly great individuals. And one thing about coach Raymond's, I, I like to share this is, you know, coach Raymond's is the reason why I have a college degree. So coach Raymond's wow. was not only the assistant coach, but Coach Raymond's put together our schedules. He knew the professors mm. that we needed to take, what classes we used to take. Mm. And then uh, you remember, we, uh, we, we would still do, uh, um, when, when class enrollment, we had to get you up and you had to go to the old gym and go through all your stations to get your classes, right? Well, Coach, mm -hmm. Raymond, mm -hmm. Coach Raymond's would be right there. And so we would get there at 7.30 in the morning. So we make mm. sure we got the classes that we want. Coach would walk us through it, make sure we had the right schedule. He had everything all mapped out for us. And wow. for all four years, for all four years that I was at Marquette, Hank did that for us. And not only me, but every other player that went to Marquette, they would tell you that Coach Raymond's, without him, I would never have a college degree or I would never be who I am because he taught me how to use the other parts of my life and the things that was going to help me be successful other than my athletic and my basketball abilities. Mm. See, when I got to Marquette, we got a little spoiled. I wasn't as quite like that. We had a good old trusty Tom Ford down there who was, who was handling all the business. Tom Ford was the guy for us. He Man, was, Tom was good. Tom classes. was very good at it. Yes, he was. Tom was good. Tom was good. I still see Tom now. Tom is doing well. He's retired, but he he's still down in racing and stuff. And and actually, we were together. Uh, Marcus West went into the uh, Racine Hall of Fame maybe about five years ago, and he invited me hey. down. And, and Tom was there, and uh, he invited Tom also. And uh, when when Marcus went in, but Tom is doing well. I still see him at some events because I still work at Marquette as an athletic ambassador and doing a lot of things in the community. So, but he's doing well. But Tom but uh Tom Ford is a good man and y'all had some good people and and Tom made sure you take care of what you were supposed to and and you should be blessed yeah, yeah. for that because a lot of schools don't have it like that. That was important, especially for all of us, because 
you know, and you was there, Will, and even though you went to St. Joe's, you know, we all needed some some prepping for, for that next level and stuff because, you know, it was taken to a next level, and then they taught us how, you know, to do what we had to do to be successful in life, and that's what it's all about. I was going to ask you on that national championship uh, 77 team, uh, the teammates you had on there, who was your best teammates? Who did you who did you jail with on the court? And do you guys still talk today? Oh, well, everybody, man, from from the from the walk ons on the team all the way to the stars. We all were very close. And uh, the championship year, uh, we had a uh, Butch Lee was from New York City. He was a junior. Uh, Jimmy Boylan, who was the coach of the Bucks and uh, the Bulls. He was from Jersey City. Actually, Jimmy and I was in the same class, but he transferred to Marquette, so he set out a year. And uh, then myself, then we had Jerome Whitehead, who was from Waukegan, who was actually a year behind me. And then uh, uh, Bernard Toon was also on that team from Yonkers, New York. Bernard was a mm-hmm. sophomore. Bernard was a uh, Bernard was deadly too. That boy could play. Actually, they were talking about Bernard coming out of high school with Bill Willoughby and them back before it was big like it is now. That was right after Moses and stuff. So uh, we we we, really? we had a whip and uh, but all of my teammates and all of them and, and well, all of us get together if, if they're close by. You know, they all come and it's actually a fellowship. It's not only uh, to raise money in my daughter's name and help mm-hmm. people, but we also have a chance to get together and have fun and fellowship and mm-hmm. talk yeah. about it. And even if they don't golf, they just come out and see everybody. So that, that that's that's that that's what's been fun. And, and then, but all of my friends and the team before that, uh, my junior year, we we lost Earl and. Uh, Lloyd, those were the only two seniors after that season that we only lost two games, but all of them, a lot of them are still around. We all are very close. Mm. You know, we talk all the time, and a lot of them come out to the golf outing, and like I said, this is uh, coming up on year 14, July the 19th, and we all get together, have a good time, and I pay for all of the market players to play for free. I don't ask them for anything. I just ask them to come. And the people that mm. pay, you know, I put them with them, and, and that's how we take it. And I have some tremendous sponsors. I, I work for some individuals. I work for a Marquette man named Craig Caston. He's one of the big supporters of the program. He has a building, and I do some things for him as a, a, a director of community outreach. So when I'm out in the schools, mm. I'm working for Skies and Ann for Marquette. And, and actually, Craig, uh, over the last six years, uh, he's been doing the thing over in Tanzania. He's uh, he's supplied uh, the uh, African people of Tanzania, kids and older adults, with over Ooh. eighty thousand free eye exams and over forty thousand free pairs wow. of glasses. Now we were talking some years ago wow. after he had took that trip and he had told me he wanted to do some things like that. And he's one of my biggest supporters for, for my golf outing. So uh, two summers ago, me and the wife, I went to Africa. I went to Tanzania uh, to see what they Man. do. And uh, when I saw it, it was one of the most humbling and greatest experiences of my life. And when I was younger, I always said I wanted to go to Africa. So I had turned 65 mm-hmm. two, two summers ago and I was tired of traveling. And the one girl that runs this program asked me, did I want to go? She said, I think the people there would live. So mm. I thought about an 18 hour trip and that trip we took to Australia that year. Yeah, we, that was long. You know, it was almost as far as that, but not quite as far. So I went to see exactly what he had did, and, and it's one of the greatest things I ever did and the most fun that I ever had. And actually, my wife went with me. So we were there like 12 days and all just watching the people and just seeing Africa and, you know, seeing Tanzania and seeing the city. And we went to some remote parts of Africa and, and we did a little did a little safari and, and went. So that oh. was one of the greatest things I ever did in my life. And I, I, that was on my bucket list, but I didn't know it was my bucket list until it came up, 
Well, I was glad, I was glad to be a part of that to see what he does and, and what he did, and uh, it's just just great. So I've been I, I've been truly blessed, brothers. I've been blessed. Well, both two things we got um we do the segment called halftime. We're gonna hit you okay. with some quick hitters, man. Here it is, number one, your top three Marquette players of all time. Earl Tatum, Bo Ellis. Oh, no, I can't put myself in there, huh? Okay. I know that guy. I know Bo Ellis. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Uh, can I? Yes, okay. You can. Okay. <laughs> Bo Ellis, Earl Tatum, and I would say, no, I actually, I'll take myself out. I'm going to say George Thompson, Earl Tatum, and Jim Jones. But it's, it's kind of hard to do that because – I got to be in there. And then, you know, Dwayne Wade, just, you know, success that he had. But, you know, from the old school and them three, yeah. that, those will, would be my top three. Next question. Top three music artists of all time. For me, Bob Marley. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. War. Oh, man, that's, that's a tough one. Because I love jazz. But Marvin Gaye. Stevie Wonder. Ooh, Marvin Gaye. It's a smooth crooner there, baby. I knew you were going to say Marvin <laughs> Gaye. Listen, I told him you was going to say Marvin Gaye. I said, man, I remember when we went on that, that trip to, um, to Australia. So we was all in the back of the bus. And, you know, we listen to music. You know, we listen to our hip-hop. It's 1991, <laughs> so we listen to hip-hop. Both come back there. What y'all listening to? Y'all need to listen to some of this. So he slaps a CD in my hand, man. And this Marvin, it's Motown 25 <laughs> with Marvin Gaye on there. Talking about some less Jimmy Terrell. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, Marvin was way before his time. Yeah, that was good times, man. Yeah, absolutely. Hit him, Will. So, Bo, your most talented players you coached. Just give us two. That's a good one, boy. I got 17 years in. Uh, yeah. Ones that just stick out. One that just pop out like. Man, I, I can't believe he did that shit. Tony Smith was one of them because Tony was unbelievable. He Ooh, just yeah. got caught up in a Marquette uh, era that was kind of on, on the downfall. But Tony was a tremendous talent. And uh, I'll tell you another one that I thought, D Damon Key was an uh, unbelievable talent also. Damon just couldn't slam down to... Uh, to, to figure it out, to get his weight under control. But, but you know, for his size and being able to shoot and the things he could do, uh, uh, Damon was a tremendous talent, too. I'll give you another one. Uh, Tony Miller was a tremendous talent, too. T Tony was an unbelievable winner. He, was, he didn't have all the gifts as far as, you know, the deadly jump shot and all of that. But as far mm -hmm. as being a winner... And running a team and guarding somebody and playing hard, he was as good as uh, the ones that I ever became face to face with. And then one that you didn't ask me about that I like to say, and a lot of people always ask me, the best player that I played with at Marquette was Earl Tatum, bar none, from Mount mm. from out, Mount Vernon, New e. York, six six, unbelievable talent. And Earl played in high school with Gus Williams, Rudy Hackett. This high school team at that time was mm. considered to be one of the greatest high school teams ever. And, and Earl is from Mount Vernon, and Denzel Washington is from Earl's neighborhood. But Earl was a tremendous talent. And, and Shaka Smart asked me that mm. when I first met him. He said, Bo, other than yourself, who you think is the best player to play at Marquette? And I told him the one, for me, the best player that I played with at Marquette was William Earl Tatum from New York City. Great talent. Run, jump, mm -hmm. shoot it. Coach, Coach McGuire called him the Black Jerry West. And that was way before the three-point mm. line. <laughs> but but he can guard, he can handle, he could probably guard all five positions and a uh, uh, tremendous mm. talent. Wow. All right, next one. Black Jerry West. This one tough for you, Bo. Toughest teams and players you played against. Adrian Danley, Notre Dame, probably Alex English, South Ooh. Carolina. Actually, it was this one kid that played at a he played at a smaller school in South Carolina in Carolina. His name was Kirby Thurston. His brother was about six seven, six eight, 
built like a brick shit house, strong, could shoot it. This boy, this boy could go. He he was one of the best that I played against in college. But but the two that that really stands out now. Remember, I played against Junior Bridgman. I played against the David Thompsons and, and all of them. The ones that for me going head up against man would have been Alex English and Adrian Dantley, and both of them are turn out to be really close friends. Adrian Dantley and myself, we played together in the Dapper Dan which would have been equivalent to the McDonald's mm. All-Star game back then. And we played, uh, we were on the United States All-Star mm-hmm. team, and they, and they would have the best players from Pennsylvania in that game, and we destroyed them. And after that year, they changed it up. They didn't have the Pennsylvania-USA. They combined everybody because we we destroyed them that year. But those two individuals was so two of the some of the best that I played against, but I played against some great ones. Favorite place to eat when you're in Chicago? It used to be seafood. That used to be this little fish place that was right across the street from Kenwood and Hyde Park. But other than that, I, I would say Lawrence Fishery. Lawrence is always Lawrence Fisheries. Oh. Really? Yeah. So and, and then uh, but that was my spot. And and uh, then you know you you you, all, you always had the uh, Army Lou's and. Uh, the soul food places. I just can't think of the names that, that was on uh, <laughs> that, that was on uh, Stony Island and 79th Street. But uh, but uh, but the seafood. They yeah, used to have a jack salmon. That was one of my favorites, and I always and still love uh, Lawrence Fishery right today because I love me some shrimp. I still love me some shrimp. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's up. Your top three jerseys of all time at Marquette. Probably the Bumblebee, the powder blue one that we wore my junior year into senior year. And then I I think the one that they had, uh, the white, and they had the black and gold stripe with the zero circle in the middle. Kind of like the Indiana uniforms? Gordon Tech used to wear them in high school, probably when y'all was around. Gordon Tech used to wear that uniform. It, it was, uh, they, they had the big circle and the number one are right there, but but those might be the three uh, all time favorites for me. Not your on tuck one. Yeah, I said that. That was the baby blue one. I said that, that. Oh, the baby blue, powder blue. Yeah, the powder blue. I say baby. Yeah, the powder blue with the gold trim. That was always a favorite too. Love the gold trim. Which, by the way, that jersey behind me. Obviously, you know it's the one you designed. But you know where that jersey comes from. Uh, I was wondering because I, I can't see the number on her. The tribute game that we did, right? Exactly. The NCAA, was that the game? Did we do that game at, at the Barry Center or is that the one we did at the Mecca? We did that one. Actually, we did that one at the Bradley Center. But that was the 25th year anniversary of uh, y'all winning the championship. How did you get it? Uh, they, they played. Uh, the NCAA allowed the team to uh, wear and play. We, we had to. Uh, uh, sent in to get permission, and they they let the team play because it was our 25th uh, year anniversary and stuff. And, and actually, that's the one we wore my senior year. But I got that one downstairs in the basement or in the frame on the wall that they gave to me and stuff. But uh, mm-hmm. but that's the one we wore wow. senior year and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a classic. Mm-hmm. Thing. You don't have to get you a frame to put them in, brother. I know, I know. I told my wife that too. And you gotta get your. That's the original wheel. Yeah, that's the original. That's the one I played in. That's, that's the original. That's the one you played in. That's the in. one I played in. What? Did you keep the shorts too? Yeah, I got the shorts. Oh yeah, wow! Yeah, I got the shorts. Was they short? Was they short? Short? They made no. They made them a little longer. I think <laughs> they were a little longer. Uh, they they was made a little different. We we got them a little bit. Yeah, they would they would never put the ones on that we were. Right, on. right. They oh, want no. they want no booty huggers. <laughs> they want no booty huggers. Or I can't use the word what Bo call it. So I'm just gonna call yeah, a booty hugger. No, I won't say it. I, right, I know no. we're still on computer, but I, I, I'll leave it alone. I'll leave the net part out. Of it. <laughs> hey, hey, Bo, you can you yeah. call it what it is. What what you call them, Bo? Net huggers. You call them <laughs> net huggers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, 
Oh, y'all been fun, man. The correct political <laughs> name for him is the John Stockton shorts. Yeah. Oh, well, we was way before John Stockton. Yeah, way before that, Stockton. That before, but, but that same, no, now if you said JoJo White or one of them, Back in them, because they a little before me, that that would be a, a better comparison. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, okay. Oh man, oh man. AJ, hit him with that last one. Throw him off. Name your Mount Rushmore of NBA players. I would have to say Kareem, Connie Hawkins, Oscar Robinson, Jerry West. Big O. Uh, I, I love Bill Russell for blocking shots and. But uh, Earl the Pearl Monroe. Wow. Earl the Pearl. Wow. I thought she was going to say Wilt. You know, Kareem, you know, those are more, but 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 those were the ones, because I kind of put, I kind of idolized all them. I, I, I kind of idolized Connie Hawkins, because I was a lot like Connie way before they were let us do. I just didn't have the real big hands, but, you know, I could jump out to gym, run, handle, do all that. But when it came to, you know, moving it around. And then the other thing is what you two got to realize, I tell people this all the time, you got to remember that I was a victim of the Lou Alcindo rule. So all the four years I was in high school, we couldn't dunk. The four years I was wow. in college, we couldn't dunk. Wow. We didn't, they didn't allow dunking in college until 1977. So I couldn't dunk in high school or college. So if they would have allowed me to... What happened if you did dunk in the game? Would they kick you out or they give you a technical? They call the tech on you and stuff. But but trust me, uh, I probably did do it on them, but I just fly by the basket, put it in real quick, and take it out. It was the same way. <laughs> but, 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 but we couldn't dunk. And I, I tell people that all the time. I, I often think, and wow. I, I got ones that watch me and say, boy, just think if y'all could have dunked when you was in high school. If, it's probably a good thing that we couldn't because some of them old raggedy 10 backboards and some of them schools probably would have tore them off and stuff. Tore them off the heads. Oh, yeah, for, for, for sure. So, you know, I, I like to say that because a lot of people don't realize that we couldn't dunk. I couldn't dunk in high school. And, and I knew some other players that was unbelievable, you know, athletes. If they would have been able to dunk in high school, but, you know, it is what it is. But you know what it did? It made me a better mm. player. Taught me how to be finesse mm. around the basket, you know, use the glass, use the rim, how to trick people. So mm. it realistically, it, it made me a better player because, you know, without being able to dunk, it taught me how to, you know, use the bad glass, you know, work around the basket, shoot that pull-up jumper, go by. So though that, that was, mm -hmm. a, you know, a skill that because I couldn't dunk, it fine-tuned the other areas of my game. Well, Bo, thanks for that halftime, man. We want to just transition in this, and then we're gonna we're gonna get you out of here, man. I know we don't took up so much of your time, but I want to talk about your 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 coaching years at 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 Marquette, and in particular, I don't know if you remember this, but I want to take you back to a day. This is when Malcolm X came out, and this is all you know about social justice and that thing. But you was really big and adamant about us going to go see the movie, but one of the concerns was at the time was you know we had guys like Rob on the team and Mac and other white guys on the team, we didn't know how they would take it, you know, as a team trip going to see the movies. But why was it important that, because you was, you was championing it. Why was it important that we go see that movie at that particular time? You know, learning uh, about Malcolm, and I know more about him now than I did then, but just seeing the movie, hearing what he was talking about, just – hearing a different philosophy, and then also, you know, so you could be uh, uplifted and, and educated mm -hmm. about how things was before, you know, now or at that time, 1991. So, you know, I had always uh, uh, loved Malcolm X and, you know, I got to do it. And, and, and at a young age, it was one of the few books that I had ever read from cover to cover. I mean, I had read books and stuff, you know, but I, I'm the kind of person I could start reading. I might read, you know, 10 or 20 chapters, but I may not finish. But once I started to read the autobiography of Malcolm X and, you know, realize what he went through, I, I thought it was a good story for all of you to hear 
to show that, you know, we all come from different places and, you know, no matter what we do, you know, how we live our lives and, and how we share our stories is what's important to su the success of the younger generation coming behind us. So that's why that was so important for me and stuff. And, and through this whole pandemic, you know, and uh, with all the documentaries and all the different stuff that's available to us now, man, I, I've been just yep. teaching myself, uh, you know, about the Black Tulsa and, you know, but yeah. you know, white people have burned down a lot of other Black cities and stuff way before, you know, Tulsa. So, yep. you know, during the pandemic, because I talked to kids and with all of the things that's uh you know, uh, available to us, man, I've been still, I've still been teaching myself. And like I said, I'll be 67 in August and I'm still a young man, but, uh, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it's just educating ourselves and everybody talking about all of the different stuff going on and the Trump and what they're trying to do, you know, with this voting rights. I'm like, shit, this all, this ain't new. It's been happening forever. And, and, and that's what America is. And, you know, and I tell yep. kids, you, you need to start educating your stuff and read up because this ain't nothing new. That we've been going through through this forever. So you know, and what it is is your kids; those are the ones that's gonna make a difference. Because even you two are getting a little older, things are starting to get a little better. But the kids that you're raising, your kids, yeah. they're gonna be the ones that's gonna be the ones that's gonna be able to make that change mm -hmm. in the next change. twenty years. So. You know, for sure. Because you two, how old are you now? Will, you what, 40? 49, but I'm hitting 50 this year. I'm 48. <laughs> See there? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Years go fast, don't you, and stuff. Because I'm getting ready to turn yep. 67, and I lost my father at 47. He was only 47. I was just a junior in college, and now I'm getting mm. ready to turn 67 in August, and my mother died at 67, and I didn't realize... Until I started to get close to the age, I like my mom was that like sixty seven. My mom was still young, so that's why you enjoy yep. them. It is a blessing to yep. have. And see, you know, as you get older and you kind of lose them, when you go back and sometimes watch hoop dreams in certain parts, and you see moms mm -hmm. and them and the shit y'all went through. I, I know <laughs> it brings it, it brings some tears to your eyes and stuff, especially if you're sitting around <laughs> by yourself and stuff, but. That's why they have that thing is you, you you never forget them or you never lose them. They're always in your life, and and that's what it's all about. But keep doing what you're doing, little brothers, and God bless you. I love you both, man. And Everything you, you've you been through in your life, you lost a kid, couldn't even imagine nothing like that, of that pain. But you started the foundation in her name and is living on. What's the next chapter in the Bo Ellis hoop dream life? Just to keep doing what I've been doing, try to share my story with young people. Uh, the things I've been doing for Marquette and Skygen, going and speaking to the elementary school kids uh, in Milwaukee and, you know, just sharing my story. And see, one thing about, you know, those kids when they say Bo Ellis and Marquette and when I graduate, I like them kids don't know, but I forgot all those kids before I get there and get ready to speak. <laughs> They already have Googled me and know everything about me and stuff. So my thing is just to keep doing what I've been doing. I'm still young. I'm retired, but I'm not retired. I, I, I can make my own schedule. So I, I just look forward to uh, continue to share my story and uh, do different things like I've been doing now. But, you know, help young people, you know, take it to another level, especially with the way things are in this world now. So you know, just, mm -hmm. just be informal and and, 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 continue, and continue to share my knowledge and my story. And, you know, with the players at Marquette, I still, you know, talk to them and the coaches still have me. And, you know, and just sharing a story that I've been through. That That's what's important to me is uh, making things better, you know, for other young people to make them understand what they're going through and let them know that, listen, if I can come from 71st and normal, and go to a college like Marquette and graduate and get a degree, which is the most important thing and the biggest accomplishment of my life, you can definitely do it. So it's about applying yourself, staying smart out here, you know, say your prayers and know that you are blessed and uh, God never puts anything in front of us. 
that we can handle. So, you know, with that being said, that's what's important to me, just to keep continue to share my story. Thank you for including me, brothers, and all the best to both for you, man. I'm the gold of my era. I've been a trending topic. I'm as fly as a feather. My pocket's macroscopic. See, with time, I get better. I'm always in the action, kid. No, I got it locked from Chicago where the toughest live. Concrete jungle earn my stripes on the pavement there. You make it here, then you can make it anywhere. No comparison. Your game is embarrassing. No one can touch me. I'm all for going there again. Yeah, I think I'm ballin' like I'm Will Gates I'm hoop dreamin', tryna fight against a sealed fate More faith, think I'm ballin' like I'm Martha A.G. I'm box office and one day they gon' have to pay me Yeah, I think I'm ballin' like I'm Will Gates I'm hoop dreamin', tryna fight against a sealed fate More faith, think I'm ballin' like I'm Martha A.G. I'm box office and one day Hoop Dreams, the podcast, an Unlearning Network production Written and produced by Arthur A.G., Will Gates, Matt Hoffer, and Chantel Shan with audio engineering by Matt Savage. For more episodes, check us out at www.unlearningnetwork.com. The money get us. Gotta be a dog to survive in this cold weather. Ice in my veins, no need for a warm sweater. I'm coming for it all, best believe I won't let up, yeah. Hey, I think I'm ballin' like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a seal of fate. More faith, think I'm ballin' like I'm Martha A.G. I'm box office in one day, they gon' have to pay me. Yeah, I think I'm ballin' like I'm Will Gates. I'm hoop dreaming, trying to fight against a seal of fate. More faith, think I'm ballin' like I'm Martha A.G. I'm box office in one day, they gon' have to pay me. Yeah.